Hi there. It's great to be with everyone. I'm David Gardner, general partner at London Mitchell Partners. Uh, many of you will know us because of our early investments in the industry, uh, helping companies like Unity, Supercell, Natural Motion, Playfish get funded, and some other recent uh, interesting businesses like Singularity Six. Um, hopefully, uh, you also know Neil Young. Neil, I'd love to get you to just do a quick intro as well. Yep, I'm Neil Young. Um, I lead Forte's uh, games business um, and uh, platform business. Forte provides technologies to uh, game developers and enterprises to um, help them build products for the blockchain. You've, we are not even 30 seconds in. You've mentioned blockchain. It's great yeah. to, uh, <laughs> to I, that's Neil. I mean, we've known each other for a long time. So that's why it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, get this time together with you and, and just hear about what you're doing. I, you know, it was really super interesting that you took your world into Forte. And I just would love to hear a little bit about the journey that, uh, you know, where are you in that journey? Why did you? Why did you leave your successful career um, to jump into the middle of what blockchain represents? So just yeah, give us a little insight into that and we will dig into the detail. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't see it as leaving my successful career. I'm not even sure if it's a successful career, um, but I don't see it as leaving it. I see it as sort of uh, the, the, the natural extension of it. So, you know, around the beginning of 2021, it really became clear to me personally that the blockchain blockchains uh, had the potential to really revolutionize uh, the games industry. And I think, you know, when we say blockchain, we think immediately like, oh, NFTs and maybe, you know, tokenizing uh, game economies. But I think the opportunity for the blockchain just goes far, far beyond that. I mean, you know, because we spent time together at Electronic Arts that you would go through these platform transitions every, you know, five or six um, years. And it was such a big deal at EA. You would go into that planning cycle and try to come out of that, that platform transition uh, stronger. Um, this is not a platform transition. In my view, it's a platform transformation. And so, you know, it really ends up feeling like if you're interested in the games industry, like we have been from like a super young, you know, young age, you can't not participate in it. It's a career imperative to be, you know, to be, to be a part of it. And so it was really that that provided the kind of the underlying, uh, underlying motivation. And, you know, where, where we are today, where I am personally today is I, you know, I'm responsible for at Forte, um, for all of the endeavors inside the, the games industry, um, which obviously starts with um, helping game developers build successful products for, uh, for, for the blockchain. Um, but ultimately, I think, help participate in and stimulate that transformation of the industry um, as, as a whole. And then I also remain the executive chairman of Network Studios, uh, which is developing uh, products for the uh, for, for the blockchain. So you know, I um, you know I get to uh, cheer those guys on from the uh, from the sidelines and you know help them um, you know help them uh, try to try to move the games uh, side of the, the business forward. Now, I, I don't want to just take it as given that blockchain is the future of the industry, and what you've said is true about the total kind of rewriting here. It, it might be, um, you know, you and I spoke before about, um, in some ways it's been the wild, wild west, uh, you know, lots of concerns and, and maybe even some hardcore gamers are not convinced that this is good for the industry. So maybe we could just spend a few minutes trying to, to tackle that somewhat, because I'd love to hear your view. You've been in the industry from the early days. Uh, you've seen lots of transformations and you've been you know, part of those things that you just described at Electronic Arts and other places and help lead on the mobile transition, et cetera. So you're clearly brave about taking on new challenges. Um, but what do you feel, if you can summarize it, what does blockchain really bring to the games industry that we haven't had? Okay, maybe it's been a bit you know, more server centralized and owned by the company, but really is, you know, are there features and, and functionalities that we just we never have had before and that's fundamentally rewriting things? Yeah, I think um, I think it is. I think the, the fundamental um, innovation around blockchain is 
um, true uh, digital uh, property ownership. And, you know, when you go from renting something to owning something, uh, it really fundamentally changes um, the way you feel about it and the value that gets created there. The, you know, the, the way I like to think about it is imagine if you, um, you your house um, and that you rent that house or you own that house, exactly the same house. Um, if you need to um, repair the deck um, or, you know, uh, fix a door in the house that you rent, um, you, uh, you, you don't enjoy that, that process. Um, it's you're throwing away your, uh, investment. When you, um, look at the deck, when you're walking over it, you're annoyed that you had to spend money on it because your landlord didn't spend, um, the, the money on it. You just don't feel as good about investing in the property in the same way as you do. If you own that exact same house, that exact same house, when it's time to repair the deck, you research the best deck, you research the best wood, you put all of your effort and energy, you spend more because it feels not just like an investment in a property that you own, but it's also a property that you love. Um, and, and so there's this very fundamental human shift that changes when you go from renting something to owning something. And the potential for that and what that ultimately means, I think, in the game space, we're just beginning to um, to, to scratch the surface off. And so, you know, getting to the place where you have provable, you know, ownership of assets. And then once you have provable ownership of assets and then transportability of those assets, not necessarily to take, you know, uh, uh, a skin that you've got in one game and move it into a, into another game, but just to be able to access the, um, the liquidity of audience, because now that asset can move in or out of a, um, of a product really begins to open up um, the opportunity, uh, the opportunity space for, you know, in and around games. And we have a fundamental problem, certainly on the mobile side of the games um, industry right now, which is, you know, only seven or 8% of the audience actually participate um, in the game economies. So if the mobile games industry, right, has gone from being this $10 billion a year industry, you know, a decade ago, representing a small segment of the overall games industry to a hundred billion dollar a year industry and 50% of the overall games industry um, a decade later. And that hundred billion dollars is being driven by a relatively small portion um, of the audience. Imagine what happens if, right, you can go from having seven or eight percent of the audience participating um, actually in the game economies to having 50, 60, 70, 80, or a hundred percent of the audience participating uh, in it. And now imagine uh, that the, um, the innovation of digital property um, and the, the true ownership um, allows that that value get redistributed throughout the ecosystem in a, um, in a different way, which brings us back to the point you made about sort of gamers and you know, their skepticism um, around uh, blockchain and you know, NFTs or, or fungible, uh, fungible tokens. If you dig deeply into this and you deeply understand it and you start thinking it through to the, to the end game, this is a huge win for players. You know, the, the opportunity to um, participate in games where you actually own the assets and you can own them and derive economic value from them, or you can own them in the way that you own your house, you know, where there is economic value. but you love it and you care more about it and you're willing to spend more time uh, with it. I think that's, I just think that's so, so uh, powerful. And I think you follow that all back to the sort of the innovation around uh, the blockchain and being able to uh, prove, uh, prove ownership. Okay. So for you, it's, it's a lot about ownership, but I guess right now um, it's been complicated, right? It's, Wallets are complicated um, for developers. It's complicated. What, what do you, you know, what does Forte represent for a sea change in, in, in improving that situation? Well, I think the um, the market is incredibly nascent. So the good the good news for people who are you know watching this and asking themselves like, oh, you know, am I, you know, you know this this feels like it might be a career imperative. Am I am I too late? Uh, to enter the space, 
Uh, the answer to that is no, you're not too late to enter the, the space. We're really at the very beginning of um, a transformation that I think is going to, you know, play out, you know, over the next five, 10 years before we get to some form of maturity. And so when you look at the market through that lens and you say, okay, you know, challenges with, with um, wallet interfaces, the user experience and uh, blockchain is, um, is terrible for the large part interacting with um, the blockchain is a far cry from the quality of uh, UX that, you know, we've come to expect to build for our customers in the, um, in the game space. Um, the technologies are nascent. It's very difficult if you are a uh, developer about to embark on a, a game that's going to take you 18 to 24 months to uh, just to enter soft launch and you have to pick your chain now. You know, there's so much variability uh, in, in the space. You know, uh, will Ethereum's merge make a difference? You know, uh, how will these... Um, uh, how will these hacks manifest in, you know, in bridges? And, uh, you know, will there be a new chain that appears uh, based exclusively on zero knowledge proofs that, you know, can both be an L1 and be fast enough uh, for you to be able to operate your games on top of? And games, by the way, are at the very pinnacle of, you know, transaction volume uh, relative to really all other, in, you know, all other industries. And so, you know, what Forte does is essentially provide the technology that allows developers, game developers, and, you know, other application developers to um, mitigate that risk, you know, to, you know, use our technology to be able to um, write, read and write, mint, burn, um, access um, uh, unique blockchain uh, facets and technologies easily while um, just focusing on the thing that they do well, which is, was built, is building a game. And that lets, uh, lets us take the risk associated with all of those um, those other things, you know, we, so if, if I, go well, I was just going to say, we've talked a lot about ownership, right? The, um, the other side of the equation here is fun, right? So if the technology allows ownership, um, you want the best game makers in the world thinking about what's the new fun that can be built, the new entertainment that can be built, um, where those two things, uh, truly, uh, truly intersect. I don't think we get to the place where, uh, on the game side, that the industry really starts to flourish until we have, you know, really good games um, that have uh, ownable assets at the at the center of them. Do we have any? Do we have any examples of that yet? Do we have any really good games? No, I don't think so. I mean, there's there's um, there's uh, promising games that are under um, under development, but I don't think that there's anything that you can point to. That is um, something that buyer on an absolute standards basis, we would look at and say, this is a really great piece of software. And um, by the way, the definition of great um, needs to respect the modality of the, you know, the medium. Um, you know, the definition of great in a console game is different than the definition of great in a mobile game. It's definition, you know, different definition uh, of, a, of a truly social um, game. And so it's all of those different game types that I think we're going to have the opportunity to and what, advance. And what, what do you think defines great then on on a you know a web web three or a blockchain game? What is great? Is it is it just to be able to make money, or is it uh, no? Is there no. no? I don't think it's. I mean, uh, you mean for the player or for the, yeah, um, for, the player. Or for yeah, the? How does the player say yeah. this game is great? You know, I bought this for ten yeah. bucks and now I'm selling for. 10. I love this game. Yeah. I don't think it's, I don't think it's about making money. You know, I mean, I think that right now we're so fixated on uh, that because of what, what Axie has, has been able to do, which is, you know, no mean feat, but you know, my view, my personal view um, is that play to earn is um, a feature, uh, not the whole thing. And it's very difficult to build sustainable gain economies if they center exclusively on play to earn. Now you might want to play and earn or play own and earn. And those that then sort of extracts, you know, fun ownership and value, um, economic value back to the, uh, back to the player or to some segment of the players. But, um, I don't think, I don't, I don't think that the fixation on money is, uh, is healthy. Like we don't play games, uh, for, for money. You know, we can play games for money and make, you know, and make money. And there are new interesting industries, but 
you know, the, the 4 billion, 5 billion people on the planet who play games, um, they're not doing it for, for money. They're doing it for fun. And so we've got to figure out how to elevate the fun through ownership, the enjoyment, you know, fun sort of, in, you know, conjures up this image of like, oh, you know, it's, it's fun. It's, you know, games are fun, but it's really about delivering enjoyment uh, for people. I enjoy, you know, fixing that thing in my house and the house that I own, right? Uh, because I own it and I feel special about it. It's that enjoyment that I think we've got to, got to get to, which is probably at the intersection of, of, of fun and ownership. It's, it's interesting on the ownership front. I mean, there, there are shifting sounds, right? I mean, we, we no longer own our music. We used to love owning our music. Now we rent it from Spotify. We used to uh, you know, own our cars. Now we love car sharing or Ubering or whatever, you know, lifting. Um, so it's interesting that ownership is, is kind of, we, all, we do want to own stuff, but it's different stuff now. I guess it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a time. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think um, you know, if we think about music and we think about cars and those, those two, you know, there's two examples. Um, there's a, a listening to music, you know, sort of having it on the background. Um, and then there's really feeling music. Like you feel, um, you know, empath empathically connected to the song maker and there's a sense of ownership um, in that, that, you know, transcends the, the efficiency of the medium. And then with cars, there's the activity of going from place A to place B. Um, but owning a car is not about going from place A to place B. It's about driving the car. It's about the way that the car sounds or feels or, you know, and uh, I think those things um, are true in the, um, in, in the game space, especially when, you know, games are not utilities. They're not about getting us from place A to place B. Um, there are in many ways about taking us away from place uh, A, you know, and uh, teleporting us uh, into the magical place, uh, place, place B. And I think in those venues, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of value in that, in that ownership. So if, you know, I guess a lot of people here at the Games Beat audience are going to be from the games industry that's been growing up, um, maybe fewer from the Web3 world. What's your advice to that audience for how to approach Web3, how to start learning, how to get involved and do things? And what, what's, your, what's your best advice? Yeah. Um, you know, I think one of the most valuable um, assets that any of us can have is curiosity. Um, I think it, it's difficult to make those types of transitions with your career um, if you're not um, curious. And so you've got to find ways to stimulate that curiosity um, and start going down um, the rabbit hole and going on the journey of understanding sort of what this world and this landscape uh, looks like. And so, you know, there's all, all the resources you can imagine. There's all the discords, all the, you know, all the um, people to follow on, um, on Twitter. There's all the white papers um, to read about the, um, about the chains. Um, Andreessen Horowitz has actually a very good, which was turned out to be my kind of like starting point um, on uh, on the blockchain. They have a uh, really good primer um, that literally says, "Look, here's all the things. Here's a whole ton of articles um, to to read to begin sort of starting um, the journey." Just like anything new, um, it feels like um, you know the blockchain space, the crypto space. It feels like there's a lot of acronyms and there's a lot of hoodies. You know, it's like <laughs> once you get past the acronyms and the hoodies, what you realize is that there are really good people who are um, uh, who are solving problems that are quite similar in many ways to the problems that we've been tackling uh, in in the game space. You know, living on the edge of technological um, innovation, trying to build things for users um, at, at scale. And so once you get beyond that initial kind of like, oh my goodness, this feels completely foreign and you begin to understand the vocabulary, you know, you find that all that experience that you've, that you've built over time is incredibly valuable. The hard part is not learning the crypto space it, when we think about blockchain and gaming. The hard part is learning how do you make great games? You know, that's the things that we've taken our entire careers doing, or how do you build, you know, solutions and services for people inside the game space? That's actually the really difficult thing 
um, that we've spent our entire careers, you know, working towards. And, you know, crossing over the bridge from, you know, from one ocean to the, um, to, to, to the next might seem scary, but it's, um, it's really, um, it, it's really not once you push yourself through. So I would say, um, I would say that. So, so from your point of view, is it crossing the ocean? Is this a new world? Is it as, as dramatic as uh, what, you know, going from console to mobile and going from premium games to free to play? And or is it is it's it much more dramatic? Of a quantum? Yeah, it's much more dramatic so than that. Who's be the most are, are, are new people coming in going to be the most successful, or is it going to be people who have all that game experience, all that kind of? Hey, it's harder to learn how to build a great game. People that bring that knowledge to it. Uh, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be a synthesis of um, people with experience working with people who understand this new space and coming together and collaborating on building um, new things together. There are unique um, points of view and perspectives that I think are the ethos of blockchain gaming that are kind of um, at the core of. Uh, the kind of the maximalists uh, view of the world. And there are some components of that that I think um, are valuable. I think the key here is to remain open-minded, but going, going back to the question of like, Hey, is this like, you know, one console to the next or, you know, um, premium to free to play or, you know, f- flip phone to, um, to, to smartphone. I think it's a much more profound change than that. Those transitions were either were focused, you know, they, they had a, a local focus. They were locally focused on consoles or they were locally focused on um, a type of game or a geography or, you know, this um, is not bound by those things. Um, and it's going much, much faster. I think that's one of the things that um, is probably readily apparent to everyone as it's moving at a blistering pace because it's not limited by, um, uh, by atoms. You know, it doesn't require new physical hardware to be deployed that starts the next cycle of the industry. Um, it's, you know, it's really moving at the speed of uh, the speed of software. And so you've got, you know, um, the uh, the fact that the um, that this is software, not hardware, um, the degree of long term value creation that um, that can kind of come from this space. Uh, multiplied by the degree of short-term financial opportunity that I think uh, you know uh, people have seen in the space is really making it go very, very, very quickly, and the developments are happening very, very, very quickly. So, you know that that necessarily means that there's some degree of volatility um, in the uh, in the in the space as well, uh, but that also makes it exciting for pioneers. And what you, what are the biggest things you've learned coming out of uh, you know most recently in the mobile space and going into this? What's kind of you in the face around, and you mentioned a few things there about speed and things. What, what else? Yeah, pace of change. I would say pace of change is one of those um, one of those things. Um, compliance and security um, is another big piece of the puzzle. It's something that Forte has um, invested a lot of time, effort, and energy uh, within. You know, you talked about you talked about uh, the space feeling like the Wild West. Um, it can't stay like that, right? We have to have um, you know, we're a, we're a, you know, in the United States, a nation of, uh, of laws and, uh, those laws have to be, uh, applied. Uh, we have to have consumer protections, um, in place across the, across the space. You know, we have to get to, we have to get to the, to the point where, um, the environment is safe and secure, um, and lawful in all the territories that, you know, that we, that we come out, uh, in on, on our products as an industry. And that's non-trivial. You know, it's non-trivial to think about money transfer. Will Forte be doing all of that? If I'm if I partner up with Forte, can I just rest? Yeah, yeah. We we provide you know access to um, uh, to compliant uh, payment rails with you know KYC, you know your customer KYW, you know your wallet, anti-money laundering. Uh, we you know we have a collection of um, through our our partner PTI a collection of money transfer uh, licenses in the United uh, in the United States. Um, and so, you know, when you're having these stores of value, right, where, um, where value is being transferred from one place to another in the United States, that's a regulated activity. And a lot of the, the stuff that's happening in the, uh, in the space right now is just ignoring that. Um, and that can take 
folks down a bad path. So, you know, our view, our long-term view is ultimately for this to be a mature space, um, you have to be thoughtful about compliance. And of course, you have to be thoughtful about um, security, the security of um, of the assets that you're custodying for um, for, for, for players. So it's um, that adds a degree of complexity that game developers have not yet had to um, not yet had to deal with. In the free to play, you build a free to play game. If you mess up the economy, it's bad, but you can make adjustments. Um, in this world, um, if you mess up the economy, um, you're really dealing with real value and real uh, real money. Uh, and so that is, you know, some some parts of your game economy will be two way doors, you know, where you can, you know, go in and go, oh, made a mistake, let's go out. Others are one way doors that really affect, um, you know, humans in real ways. So you have to be really, really thoughtful about that. Absolutely. And I would say the third thing, yeah, substantial. The third thing I think is just the scope of opportunity. Um, it is when you start taking those little steps to go, okay, let me for a second put my skepticism aside um, and try to imagine what our world might look like, our games industry world might look like in this um, if these things come uh, come to pass. And you start thinking about what does that mean for um, distribution? You know, not just game making, but what does it mean about distribution? What does it mean about guilds? What does it mean uh, about marketing? What does it mean about advertising? What does it mean about tools and um, tech technologies? Um, you begin to imagine a complete reshaping uh, of the of of the landscape. You know, you can imagine a world where player DAOs, you know, decentralized autonomous organizations, um, become the new um, marketing channels. You know, where you've got yeah. aggregated yeah. audiences with interest and intent operating with share capital. Um, that's a fundamental shift for an industry that has been dependent upon. Uh, Facebook, you know, or Google for performance, uh, you know, performance marketing. So, so I think it, it, what I would encourage people to do is, is just take a moment to make that mental leap. And I think you'll find it incredibly exciting. Um, Neil, it's, it's already, you know, we've sp spent 30 minutes talking about this stuff. I, we've just barely, we just blown the dust off the cover of the book. Um, and there's so much to, to go into, and I'd love to continue the conversation. Probably we should, you know, do this offline, mint some kind of NFT, and sell it to people to, uh, to pay for our time. But I'm afraid, uh, I'm afraid Dean takes all the economics on this, so we're going to let people uh, do this through GamesBeat. It's been really great to connect with you on this. Thank you very much, um, and thanks, yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. It's been a great time. Yeah, thank you, David. It was wonderful. Thanks, everyone.